So I'm John Henderson Sinclair, born in Belen, New Mexico, July 26, 1924. I was born just a few hundred yards from the Rio Grande, and my parents were very uh, disciplined from, from their Scottish heritage. We had faithful family worship in which we learned to pray out loud. I was the youngest. I had five older sisters. We had very good youth camps of the church. I had some wonderful role models uh, in, the, in the youth youth ministry. And they always had the time for commitment and vocation. And you wrote yourself a letter saying what you would like to do. And you sealed it and they gave it to the counselor and they said, We'll send to put it in the mail to you someday. Well, two years later, I get this letter with my own scrawl in it. <laughs> and I opened it and I read it and it said, you know, I think I'd like to be a minister. <laughs> my father then had three daughters in college. And he said, John, I can only help you thus far. I can loan you $60 so you can buy an old car and you can drive every day to Baker University, which is only 20 miles away. And I met this dear lady in my third year and we were married in 1944. Our the planning of how we got to Latin America was predicated on the fact that the mission strategy had seen the need to get into the university community. Because we had second and third generation evangelical or Protestant young people who were only able to go to the secular university. Mackenzie University in Sao Paulo was the only Protestant university in all Latin America. And I was interested in youth work because I was then a minister of Christian education. Harry Young, who was the personnel secretary in those years, came up with this great strategic idea that we got to find six missionary couples to go to six Latin American capitals and start work with student, university students. We were chosen to, to start a university center in Caracas. We had the university experience first, and we were asked to go to a country village, which is perhaps as far in contrast uh, in, from downtown Caracas next mm -hmm. to the university. But we went out there for a year and loved it, came back and did a year of graduate work and then went back for three more years. And then the third assignment was in Chile. The Chilean church had uh, been there for about a century. They were still a presbytery of the Synod of New York. Can you imagine that after a hundred years? And so my first challenge was to get that presbytery to become the Presbyterian Church in Chile. And I had uh, some ups and downs, but uh, we finally made it. Uh, it was a time of, uh, I won't say turning over mission to the younger churches, but recognizing that we were getting in the way. And that was a time when we had to withdraw personnel. And you see, oh no, we said go into all the world and preach the gospel. But it didn't say just you Yankees. And so there was a, a period in which we began bringing uh, Brazilian um, pastors into Chile. Then they had a board, board of foreign missions already in place because they sent missionaries to Portugal beginning in 1914. I was asked to be Secretary for Latin America. We were in 17 countries and had 210 missionaries and a budget of about, about three million. And uh, so I, I learned pretty fast. Uh, I had to learn fast. I was traveling about um, 50,000 miles a year and my dear wife would, wouldn't see me for a month at a time. So I take off my hat to my dear wife who, who corralled our three sons. The Board of Foreign Missions 
before it became Comar, saw that there were two areas that we had to really work on immediately. One was inter-American relationships from North America to South America. The second area was in the United States. Uh, there's a need for Anglo-Hispanic relations. So there was a commission called the Advisory Committee on Inter-American Affairs. There was another commission on Hispanic Anglo Affairs. We merged those two and as a result we published through the General Assembly a paper called Myth and Reality in Inter-American Affairs. And out of that came transformative relationships between Anglo Presbyteries and Hispanic churches in the United States, between North American churches, Presbyterian and Latin American Presbyterian churches. And so that process went through uh, about 15 years and I was Secretary for Latin America during most 13 of those 15 years. My passport said valid except in communist countries. And I went to John Smith and I said, John Smith, what do I do? I've been invited to Cuba by Cuban pastors. He said, you go to Cuba. We'll deal with the passport after you get back. We had a friend in the United Nations who was secretary of the Communist Party in Cuba. And he said, you show up at the Mexican Embassy, at the Cuban Embassy in Mexico City, and we'll have a visa for you. And so, lo and behold, I did. Showed up at the Embassy. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. They were so happy to see someone from uh, the mission board there. And, of course, I still think to this day that it was a CIA agent who took my picture as I got on Cuba Airline. The Cuban Revolution has taught us many things if we were willing to listen to them. I mean, Cuba, the Cuban people have found a new life, but unless you're a part of the international community, you don't have really much future in this world. You and I are going to live long enough to, to see a change. We must be open to the future. There is still some surprises ahead of the people of God. So that's what makes life interesting. <laughs>